Hi, I'm Terence McNally here at Bioneers 2011, and uh, right now I'm with Philippe Cousteau. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you for having me. Uh, Philippe Cousteau is the son of Jan and Philippe Cousteau Sr., and grandson of Jacques-Yves Cousteau. He continues his family legacy as CEO of Earth Echo International, and you can learn more about that at earthecho, one word, dot O-R-G. Philippe is also co-founder of Azure Worldwide, a strategic environmental design, development, and marketing company, chief ocean correspondent for Discovery's Animal Planet, chief spokesperson for environmental education for Discovery Education, uh, special correspondent for CNN International, and the co-author of Going Blue, a teen guide to saving our oceans, lakes, rivers, and wetlands. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, you're still fairly young, but you come from a family that, uh, you know, has, has, ha has a heritage of, of, of work with the planet and with the oceans. How would you describe your path to what you're doing today? And feel really free to mention mentors or moments of decision when you went one way and not another. Well, you know, I, ever since I was little, I always wanted to be uh, a fireman. A fireman? When I was very little, I wanted to be a fireman. And then, well, I should say when I was very, very little, I wanted to be Superman. I was a big right. Superman fan, uh, as I'm sure many people my age were. Uh, then I wanted to be a fireman. And then as I got a little older into my teens, the idea of expeditions and exploration and Indiana Jones and those kinds yeah. of things, you know, captured my imagination. Couple that with conservation and you kind of keep bring the two worlds. I mean, I, I think trying to help people and help the world was always something I wanted to do ever since I was very little. And before I even understood about the legacy or what any of that meant. Uh, and then the, the, the call of, and the lure of adventure um, caused me to, to follow this path. And of course, the influence then as I got older of, uh, of my grandfather, my father, had such a tremendous, huge impact on, on me. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny. I mean, people must say, so you just went into the family business. <laughs> you know, in many ways, <laughs> uh, you know, yes, I, I did, I mean, in, in, in essence. Now, but some of the things you're doing, like with Earth Echo or with Azure Worldwide and, and, and some of that stuff, is taking it to a new area, right? Well, it, it is, and it's a different time. And it's really a response to thinking differently about the world. What my grandfather and father understood so well is that the key to providing and creating an effective message is having multiple platforms mm -hmm. through which one can distribute that message. I was so inspired by the fact that they did live events. They had uh, movies and books and uh, worked with musicians and radio. I mean, at the time, they really looked at all the different platforms that they Th had. That were, that were there then. Yeah. That they could communicate through. Yeah, yeah. So for us now and for me, it's really taking inspiration from that past and that, that methodology and doing what I do now. We gotta be, I believe we have to be in schools, we have to be on television, we have to be in books, we have to be in magazines, we have to be, you know, we're doing something in financial markets now. We have to, the internet, of course, a new technology. We have to be in a lot of different places with a consistent, inspiring, and empowering message if we're gonna have any impact at all. What are you doing in financial markets? Well, that's the newest project that we're engaged in, one I'm very, very excited about, actually. We just announced last week what is called the Global Echo Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an exchange traded fund, which is a type of mutual fund that's traded on the stock exchange. In this case, the New York Stock Exchange. And our ticker symbol, when it comes out, will be GIVE, G-I-V-E. And what it is, is a, a sustainable investment fund. However, that doesn't just stop there, because there are sustainable investment funds out there. Not enough, but the few. Um, it hasn't launched yet, it'll launch at the end of the year. And a percentage of the management fee, now all of these types of funds have management fees, a uh, percentage of that will go into a charitable foundation. So, in other words, you're hitting it two ways. One, you filter what you invest in, and two, you take off the top. It's a new way of leveraging Wall Street to do good, and it was a result of a frustration during the Great Recession, as they called it, two, two and a half years ago, where I was lamenting to a friend of mine who works in Wall Street about, uh, like, there's just not enough money out there that's going towards solving the world's problems. Not just for what I do, but in general. And, well, uh, one thing, see if I'm right, just, mm -hmm. uh, which is that when a recession hits, A, there's less funds, there's more needs, but people look for things that are helping somebody with a meal or, or shelter. 
And so the bigger picture, long range sort of uh, solutions well, get, get short shrift at that point. Terence, you're totally right. You know, the, the, in the first place, the environmental movement, or certainly the nonprofit movement as a whole, never got a bailout. And yet we employ more people than the car companies and the banking company industry combined. We never got a bailout. Far from it, our contributions, not just for my organization, but in general, go down. So it's, a, it's a compounded, and yet there's more need. Yeah. So not only to feed people, but you're right, already the piece of the pie that goes towards education and environment, things like that, is one of the smallest. Yeah. So it, it, it's, a, it's a multitude of factors that come together and make it hard. And a friend of mine said, what about financial markets? So that uh, bit of the management fee that goes toward things will fund your foundation? That sort a of thing? percentage of it will. It will be an independent nonprofit granting, philanthropic organization. Oh, okay. uh, and our three areas of focus are women in water, social entrepreneurship, like microcredit, micro, credit, micro uh, insurance, things like that, helping you know, teach a person how to fish as opposed to give them mm -hmm. a fish, kind of old adage. And then, of course, environment and education. OK. Um, you also did a short NRD film. D NRDC film, Ocean Blueprint, Planning mm -hmm. for a Marine Environment. That whole notion of an ocean blueprint means something to you, right? It does. It's, it's part of my work that's been going on for a few years, predating the oil spill. But really, it was brought to a, a higher level of urgency after the oil spill. I testified in Congress about a year and a half before Deepwater Horizon happened in the Gulf of Mexico, talking about this growing movement of blueprint or zoning or uh, uh, marine spatial planning, where basically we're saying we're using the ocean in a lot of different ways. It's kind of a, a circus out there. It's just a hodgepodge of uses, and they all conflict with each other, and there's no planning that goes around that. And we need to be planning better for the use of our oceans to make sure that those uses continue. And after the oil spill, it became very clear that that certainly is a, is a problem. And so we also did this film with the Natural Resource Defense Council, as you said, to bring this issue of blueprinting the oceans and allowing, essentially it's like zoning for different uses, right. and making sense of the disorder in the oceans. And how has uh, the Obama administration's leadership been on that issue? On that issue, the leadership has been very good. They uh, signed in an ocean uh, act uh, of sorts about a, two, a year and a half ago or so, a year ago, that really looks at broader ecosystem-based management. It looks at marine spatial planning as a way to try and find what areas are appropriate for exploiting fisheries, yeah. et cetera, let, what areas aren't. Let me it's in definitely in for, been good. Yeah, let me cut in for a second on that, because I think I'd like you to spell out even a little more. In other words, we've got the metaphor. It's sort of like business planning or strategic planning for an ocean area. What does it really come down to? In other words, what will, what will be something that will be different because the plan is in place? Well, with a plan like uh, an effective plan, a marine spatial plan, it means that we can map what the space is. It, basically, it says, okay, we have a very rich seamount here or a deep sea coral reef. We shouldn't go and put an oil platform or dredge fisheries through that. It would be like saying, you know, this is a national park. Right. We don't want to build a, an oil derrick in a national park. So it's that same kind of idea. It's like zoning on land. It's that this is appropriate for commercial. This is appropriate for residential. This should be a park. This should be a, a business district. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing in the ocean. So okay. we, have, we have a plan. Um, you, uh, when I look at what you're about, a lot of it, a certain percentage of it seems to appeal to youth. What's your, uh, what's your sense of your mission in that regard, and what's your sense of, of how youth look at the kinds of goals you have? Well, young people, I believe, are the, are the hope for the, not just for the future, but for the present. And I always tell people, you know, Earth Echo International, we're one of the largest um, youth environmental education organizations in the country by reach. And we uh, provide resources to middle and high school students to get them engaged in their communities to take action to improve the health of their communities, both the environment and, and the, the, the infrastructure, whatever, whatever they're interested in, in their communities. And what I always remind people is that a billboard on a sign somewhere talking about conserving the oceans, I think might have a negligible influence on the everyday person driving past and thinking about, oh, I'm really going to change my behavior because there's a billboard. That's important. Because repetition matters. Repetition right. matters, absolutely. But I believe it's much more effective to be targeting young people. Because I never, ever had anybody come up to me and say, I, it's because I read an article or because I saw an advertisement that I'm doing something for the environment. I have people come up to me all the time. My kids come home every day going, Mom, Dad, why aren't we recycling? Mom, Dad, why aren't we doing this? Mom, tugging on this every single day. Then they go, oh, fine. So we believe that there's a, a, a tremendous opportunity in targeting young people 
they already care about these issues. They know that it's them that's going to have to clean up these messes. If we can empower and engage them to influence their parents today, as well as their own behavior right. when they can vote and et cetera, um, we can affect a tremendous amount of change today, as well as in the future. Okay. One question that I have asked a, a lot of folks uh, this year is, um, if the thing that, that links someone who might say, okay, I'm a bioneer, is that we learn from natural systems, mm -hmm. uh, and then we try to live as best we can as if we are part of nature. Mm -hmm. How does that thread go through all of your work? It's a, it's a huge part of, of everything. I think it's one of those uniting threads. My grandfather always told me and taught me that everything is interconnected. You know, I mean, we have coal dust from China that lands on the beaches of the Bahamas. Whatever we do in one spot affects another. And that's what nature's all about. And that we cannot survive on this planet without clean air and clean water. You know, he always shared a simple dream with me. And I sum them up as universal truths. I think universal truths are that every single child born should have the opportunity to walk on clean grass, breathe fresh air, drink clean water, and yet today a billion people go to sleep every night not knowing if the next day they'll have any water. That could grow to five billion by the middle of the century. We've had genocide in this, in this century already over water in, in Sudan. It's, it's, a, it's a dwindling right in many ways for people. It's disappearing. Water is, is declining. Climate change is creating much more um, uh, volatility in the system and um, for me it's it's understanding absolutely that interconnectedness it's understanding that as a saying at Earth Echo International everything you do makes a difference not that you can make a difference it's that everything you do makes a difference yeah, all of our you're choices already have consequences. Making a difference. absolutely in the Good, choices we bad, make. you're making a difference so the, the question we need to ask ourselves is what kind of a difference do we want to make yeah, yeah. and I believe that story and narrative is really essential in getting a message across when you make appearances these days, what sort of stories are you telling? You know, story is the language of learning, and you're absolutely right. I, I oftentimes tell stories in my discussions uh, with people because they're more memorable, they're more interesting, frankly. Uh, you know, a big story that I, that I share with folks oftentimes is one that had a huge influence on my life, going back to that whole interconnectedness of the world mm -hmm. message that my grandfather always taught me. It was from Papua New Guinea, which is an island just north of Australia. I was 16 years old in the Highlands, one of the most remote parts of the world. And here we were walking down a dusty road. People here live, you know, in grass huts, barefoot with grass skirts, no plumbing, water, electricity, etc. And you couldn't get further away from civilization. I'm walking down a dusty road, and I see these tribesmen coming towards me. They've just been hunting. They have bow and arrow and spears. Right, bow and arrows and spears. Exactly. No modern, real yeah. technology. And a group of younger men at the back of the pack were wearing Lakers basketball t-shirts. And that had a profound influence on me when I was 16, to see that and to think, wow, you, you know, we are so interconnected. Um, and then I think of, of you know, another story that I love is, uh, is to illustrate the power of young people. I'll give a great example. A project we worked on with Discovery Education two years ago was with uh, three 13-year-old, well, it was actually a competition, a uh, national competition for young people to do something in their environment, in their community to improve their environment. Well, three 13-year-old boys in Iowa, they were so inspired, they love cars, and they were so actually concerned by uh, a mechanics shop that they would go and visit that the lead wheel weights that balance tires, when they were switching out the lead wheel weights, they just throw them away. Uh -huh. They did some research and found out, as their summer project, that that contributes to a tremendous amount of lead pollution in the environment. And so these kids started to work with a lobbying firm, Pro Bono, in the state of Iowa, and they passed a law, 13, three 13 year old boys passed a law in the state of Iowa to phase out lead wheel weights on all state vehicles, hoping that that will then well, lead yeah, to all you, vehicles. Once you create some volume, then the exactly. market price goes down and the distribution gets easier. They'll change them over to steel. The EPA is now, because of this project, is rethinking their position on lead wheel weights in the country. Those three 13-year-old boys changed the lives of every single American in this country. I love that. And what I like is also, they're in Iowa, which is, you know, not on the coast, not near the ocean, not, you know, not Cousteau, you know, types necessarily. <laughs> and it's out of their love of cars. Yes, exactly. Which 
I well, and that's, and that's the thing. You know, we do a work called service learning. What we really do is empower young people to say, these are the issues, this is the connectivity of water, of health, of air, whatever it may be that, that the topic we're covering or they're studying in the classroom. Find something that you're passionate about in the community and find a way. You don't just have to do a recycling program. You don't just right. have to do right. a cleanup in your community. You can find something that you're passionate about. And for these boys, it was cars cutting out lead wheel weights, cutting tremendously lead pollution in the environment in Iowa and throughout the country. Fabulous. Thanks a lot, Philippe. Thank you.